It's a great pleasure to be with you. As Patricia said, I'm David Blanc, a uh, French national. I've been living in the UK for almost a quarter of a century and advising uh, um, investors for, for that time. And it's a great pleasure to be with you this afternoon with um, also George, Mary Lees. George is a, a senior partner in private wealth and tax at uh, Irwin Mitchell. And what I'd like just to start saying is that I'm not here to tell you what to do, should you stay or should you go, obviously, because I don't want to take a, a, a position on, 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 on that question. However, uh, I think what we would like to try to help you today, this afternoon, is maybe to give you some ideas of what are the options, what you could do in terms of taxes and, and, and maybe finances uh, uh, in preparation for, for Brexit. So I think the idea is that I'm going to ask a few questions to George, and maybe you know yeah, uh, I will have back. one or two questions back. But also maybe definitely we try to keep this quite short and open it for your and your questions if you have any any question. Obviously, it's a quite a, a complex and and uh, and very wide subject. So we will not have. I'm, I'm pretty sure about that. We will not have uh, all answers because actually. For a lot of the points, we don't even know. We don't. We don't know what what's going to happen. We were talking just before coming in with uh, a lot of the um, you know the, the, the MPs and and other uh, elected people, and uh, a lot of the people in, in in the room were saying, but we need we knew we need to have we need to progress on one this issue, especially pension and and and, and other issues. So please bear with us because on on a lot of the the financial questions actually. We don't know what's going to happen yet, but we'll try to, to guide you uh, and maybe as, as the subject of, of this session to try to prepare yourself for what may come. I'd like to start to ask, you know, maybe one of the key questions for, for George is that for, for European, but also maybe in, in, in a wider context for, you know, European, but also non-European, do you, be, do you believe that the UK is still an attractive place to leave from, obviously, a, a, a UK tax perspective? OK, so just to clarify before I start on this answer, we're talking about Europeans who live here, so they're probably going to be resident non-domiciled. So my answer to that is yes. Despite the changes that we've seen in the taxation of resident non-domiciliaries in the UK, the remittance basis is still available for your first 15 years, which led leads to the question, in case some of you might not be aware, what is the remittance basis? This is the basis of taxation that we have in the UK that per permits resident non-domiciliaries to keep their foreign income and foreign gains outside the UK, and unless they benefit from them in the UK, they don't pay tax. So, yeah, so that, that still exists, and it's now limited to your first 15 years. But beyond that, in terms of inheritance tax, for example, if you are non-domiciled, so you're still within the first 15 years, IHT, inheritance tax, is only chargeable on your UK assets. So everything you have outside the UK can still be outside the UK tax net. But beyond that is the business reliefs which are available to entrepreneurs, to investors in business. So we have business property relief, which is an inheritance tax relief. We have entrepreneurs' relief, which is the, is, is the tax relief when you sell your company, you only pay 10% on your first 10 million. That's a lifetime allowance. But even if you're not on the remittance basis, I do believe that our tax rates still are competitive. Yes, they're high, but they're still competitive to other Western European countries, which you might be considering moving to. So in conclusion to that, I say we're still a very business friendly and friendly to, to the resident non-domiciliaries. Thank you, George. And, and let's assume, as I said, we're not here to tell you should you stay or should you go, obviously, but, but let's assume that a person decides to leave the UK, then in terms of UK tax compliance, what does this person would need to do? Okay, well, there are broadly four categories, I would say. There's the employed, there's the self-employed, there are people who are neither but who have investment income, and they're people who fall into none of the above categories. So just going through each of, each of those groups, what would you have to do from a UK tax compliance perspective when you leave? 
Now, bearing in mind there's no formal exit like, like there is perhaps in France, and there's no deemed disposal for capital gains tax if you leave. So, for example, if you have an asset, you are, deem you are deemed to dispose of it when you leave. We don't have that. So if you fell into none of the categories above, i.e. you're not employed, self-employed, or you have investment income, you don't need to do anything. If you're employed, well, there I suggest you speak to your employers. Technically, what you need is, a P, is what we call a P85. And essentially, what you're doing there is you're making sure you're not overpaying your tax. So if you leave in month six of the tax year, for example, they would have programmed you on the PAYE system to pay enough tax for a 12-month period. So you're, you're saying, I'm leaving, please correct my tax. Now, if you're self-employed, then you've been doing a tax return every year, in which case you have to do your final tax return and you need to tell them that you've left, or you write to them, but in essence, you need to do a final tax return and you can, you can tell them at that stage. Investment income, and I suppose this is where it gets more interesting. Let's say that investment income is from a rental property in the UK, well, that means that you'll continue to get that income, of course, unless you sell your property. So there you have to continue doing tax returns. Now, the UK, in the UK, our system is, it's a, it's a self-declaration. So no one's going to come and ask you to do it. You have to do it yourself. But of course, if you don't do it, you'll have penalties, you'll have late fees. So I think, yeah, that, that, that. and if you, just one last thing, if you are self-employed and employed or you're employed and you have investment income, and essentially you need to do a tax return, you would need to do more than your P85. Okay. Thank you very much, George. You, you said that obviously if you have some, um, uh, like, like rental income, you, you would still need to, to fill a tax, tax return. Is there any other cases? Let's assume you left the UK, you know, you, you are in Europe, you know, and, and, and you've been there a couple of years. And is there any other compliance issues you have to really look at on the top of your, maybe your rental income? Yes, so, so for example, uh, well, if we look at the three taxes separately, so, so broadly how I interpret that question is, are you still going to be liable to UK tax? If we look at the three personal taxes separately, so for example, well, that's income tax, capital gains tax, and inheritance tax. On income tax, you're taxed in the UK if you are either UK resident, or if you're non-resident, then if you have UK source income. So essentially, now you're non-resident and you have UK source income, then you will be liable to UK tax, and you'll have to do a tax return. And continue to pay that tax. Now, capital gains tax, so I have clients who leave the UK who then contact me to say that they've sold their house in the UK. Now, I don't particularly agree with how much time HMRC give you, but it's 30 days from the date that you sell your house to the date you have to file your tax return and pay your tax if you are non-resident. Non now, inheritance tax is totally different. So income tax and capital gains tax, you're taxed on a res where you are resident. So, for example, if you're a UK resident, you pay the tax or CITUS or CITUS of the, of, of the income capital gain. Inheritance tax is about domicile. So domicile is different to residence. It's about where you have your permanent home. It's where you're from. So in my case, I am UK resident. I'm also UK domiciled because my father was born here. So if you are UK domiciled, you continue to be liable to inheritance tax on your worldwide assets even if you go and live abroad. So if I moved off to Australia, I would still be liable to inheritance tax. If you are non-DOM, then you are only liable to inheritance tax on your assets here. That's regardless of whether you're resident or not. And the third category is deemed domiciled. So that's where you've been, let's say, in the UK for 16 years. You become deemed domiciled. When you leave, you have a small tax tail, effectively, of how many years you have to live outside the UK before, before you come out of the tax the tax net. Now, there are a couple of things I, I wanted to add as well, is when you leave the UK, it's very important to know when you cease to be UK tax resident. It's, 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 it's not for you to decide. There are rules that will, that will tell you whether you are or whether you're not. So someone comes to me and says, we're leaving the UK, I will help plan them to leave the UK and I'll make sure that they cease being UK resident by spending as few days here as possible. Another thing to check when you do leave is to, to talk to I've mentioned it previously before, the UK deemed domicile for inheritance tax is have you acquired that deemed domicile status? And effectively, the last thing to think about is what we call the temporary non-resident rule. So for example, you've been UK tax resident in, in, in broadly seven years of the past 10, then when you, when you leave, you will 
effectively stay in the system, but only if you move back to the UK within a set time period, broadly six years. So, for example, I leave the UK today, I sell something tomorrow, I come back within three years, I can still be liable to capital gains. So these, they're these things to think about when you leave. Thank you, George. Uh, it may be just to focus on maybe one of the last key points, which actually a few people mentioned outside the room when, when we walked in. Uh, and that's you, somebody like myself, you know, I've been here a quarter of a century almost, and maybe some of my colleagues, you know, I've been here 30 years, 35 years, 40 years, Brexit happens, what do we do? Do we come back or not? Maybe we decide to come back, and then we've accumulated quite a big pension pot. What's going to happen with all, you know, with our pensions? So effectively, if this brings on to a really important, a really important point, is what happens to your pension when, when you leave the UK. So there are many types of pension, but just for the sake of this afternoon, we're going to concentrate on three. The state pension, occupational pension, so from your employer, effectively, and your private pension, so your SIPs, etc. And something we've, we've heard mentioned, and people are anxious of whether they'll still, once they leave the UK, whether they can still access it. So start first of all, and of course, if you come back, then, then I suppose that worry goes away to an extent. So starting first with the state pension, what you, what you need to do there when you leave is effectively contact the International Pension Centre. You'll find this all on the government website, and you need to tell them that you've left and where you're going. Now, the, the key thing here is with state pensions is they, these get incremented up every, every year. And of course, the the question is, is post-Brexit, if I move to Spain, will, it, will they carry on going up? And my understanding is, is that in the deal that's being proposed, the answer will be yes. And certainly yes if you move to a, in, in, in an EEA country. In terms of the occupational and the private, just make sure that you tell your employer, you tell your pension provider that you are leaving, where you're going to, and also consider getting a financial planner who will assist you on the key question of, can I transfer this pot of money to my host country? What can I do with it? How can I access it? So, so you, because effectively the, the, the point there is, you know, when you get to retirement, it would be a bit of a hassle to have five separate pots. If you can bring them all together, and of course a very important question is if you are a bit more adventurous and go somewhere like North Korea, then will they pay me my pension in North Korea? So it, it's, it's, a, it's a very real question. But it's, it's making sure that you protect your pension, your savings, and that you can still, and that you can still um, access them. Now, if I may, may, may turn, turn the table slightly. Um, so talking about pensions, which is very linked to financial planning, can you speak a little about what steps a person will take, to, well, can take to restructure their investments and their pensions? Thank you, George. I think, actually, you, you almost covered that. But I think the key point is that, unfortunately, as of today, and we were talking with our elected you know, MPs and other uh, people higher, actually, we don't really know what's going to happen, which is interesting. But that's hopefully is going to come in the next few months. So the number one thing, as, 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 you, as, as you said, I would definitely contact you know, either a tax advisor or financial planner to see what are the options you can take right now, because actually there are already some steps you can take. One of them uh, is maybe to move to an international pension scheme that would allow you, uh, first of all, maybe to invest in different currencies, to diversify your currencies, because obviously, if you want to move uh, to Europe, uh, then having assets in uh, Euro may be interesting, because if all your assets in your pension fund are in sterling, then you have obviously a currency risk. So the point number, point number one was that, can I move to an international pension scheme? And if yes, then can I diversify my asset into other currencies? And step number two would be also definitely, as you mentioned, can I aggregate, can I consolidate all my different pension into, for example, a SIP? I don't want to get too technical here, but we have what we call, you know, a self-invested pension scheme, you know, like a SIP, which would allow you to actually aggregate and consolidate all your pension fund into one and then diversify it, manage it in, in, in other currencies, and obviously throw some of the funds, hopefully, 
uh, when you are in uh, a European country. So there are solutions, there are options already. So, you know, and please contact your, uh, um, your specialist on that. So I know, I know from my own clients, <clears throat> for example, who mostly are French, but from Western Europe, they, lo they rather like the, uh, the life insurance wrapper, so the assurance vie. Now, would you recommend that people considering whether to stay or whether to leave, but who have that connection to, let's say, France or another European country, that they consider life insurance wrappers? Definitely. I think that's <coughs> one of the key points that actually you can do today in terms of investment. Even if you, you, know, you don't know what you're going to do, should I stay or should I go, definitely the, uh, a life insurance wrapper, uh, which is actually a European one, so for example, to be a bit precise, those uh, uh, from Luxembourg are actually very, very good because actually they're efficient while you are UK tax resident, but also if you move to a European country, they will be efficient. You can keep the same vehicle, which is you know, uh, what we call an offshore bond in the UK or life insurance wrapper. You can still keep it and have the tax advantages, which are really good, depending on which country you are. Obviously, in France, it's one of the main vehicles, so the tax is very reduced if you keep it for at least eight years. But again, I'm not going to get into the technicals. But the key point is that if you are considering, is if actually moving to Europe is one option, then definitely you should consider setting up that vehicle, that wrapper, because it's actually efficient, even if you stay in the UK, but also if you move to Europe. So my understanding would be it would be efficient from an income tax, capital gains tax, and inheritance tax perspective. Definitely. Yeah. <clears throat> but the more general question, I think, is what can you do now to prepare yourself for Brexit from a financial perspective? Well, uh, you know, as I think hopefully we, we've discussed yeah. uh, in, in the summary, I think that, that the idea is to do, to do a quick summary, is definitely, you know, review your option in terms of taxes, in terms of, you know, income and gain that you would that you would potentially keep if, if, you, if you move back to, to Europe. <coughs> uh, just making sure that, as you said, that basically you are really aware when you leave and you inform, obviously, the tax authorities, as you, as you mentioned. Uh, definitely look back at your pensions, because that's, that's for many people, an important asset. But also, you know, think about what are the options you can take now, even if you don't move? And as I mentioned, having a life insurance, an offshore bond, can be very efficient, even actually if you stay in the UK. So these are definitely the few steps you can do today. Maybe we should open to questions. I think we have maybe a few minutes for. No, we don't have minutes for no. questions. Sorry about that. But definitely, please go um, and, and contact George if you have any more questions. And we are available to try to help you. Thank you. <laughs>